Good morning, Riverside. It is indeed my pleasure to be worshiping with you virtually this morning. And I'd like to extend my thank you to my friend and brother, the Reverend Michael Livingston for extending to me this invitation. The scripture has been read in your hearing. So for the next few moments, I wanna preach from the subject, dream deliverers. We are indeed living in times that your spiritual leadership has aptly described as being marked by gaping inequities, systemic racism, mass death, and narcissistic leadership. Therefore, we, the people of God, must recognize the need for prophetic leadership and steadfast faith that is characterized by our biblical sheroes. And so this morning, I am calling for the Puas and the Shifras because we need them now as much as Moses and the children of Israel needed them then. I am calling for the Puas and the Shifras because we need some birth coaches who will help us cultivate faith in the midst of misery and despair that is necessary to bring forth God's vision into the world. I am calling for the Puas and the Shifras because we need midwives to help us move justice out into the world until it is no longer confined to the bodies of a few, but is accessible to all. I am calling for the Puas and the Shifras because we need more dream deliverers. We need people that will help advance the justice, inclusion, and wholeness that characterize the kingdom of God, or what Brian McLaren calls God's dream for creation. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about aiding and abetting mindless fantasies or narcissistic aspirations or anything that advances some at the expense of others. I am calling for us to participate in God's work so that what God said is what we see and experience, what God showed becomes what we see in our everyday lives, and what God has promised is what we expect. And so this is both a call and an open invitation and a heartfelt supplication because I submit to you that everybody has the potential of being a dream deliverer or a spiritual midwife. It does not matter if we are male or female, young or old, rich or poor, each one of us can bless another in a way that helps them bring forth actions and words and policies and programs and institution and lives that manifest God's dream. And this delivery requires a spiritual midwife, a dream deliverer, if you will, someone who can manage the pregnancy and birth, minister to the wounds, and make ready for the next conception. Someone who will be like Pua and Shifra in three very important ways. First, they will affirm in their day what Pua and Shifra affirmed in theirs, that the lives of vulnerable people, vulnerable because society looks down upon them for no other reason than the accident of their birth, that their lives matter. For Pua and Shifra, they asserted that Hebrew lives mattered by their actions, not just their rhetoric, by their practice and in their profession, they asserted that Hebrew lives were worthy of being preserved, protected, given safe passage into and through the world. They weren't saying that Egyptian lives didn't matter. It was just that Egyptian lives were not being threatened. The Hebrews hadn't taken up arms against the Egyptians. The Hebrews hadn't stormed Pharaoh's palace. The Hebrews hadn't sided with Egypt's enemies. The Egyptians weren't killing Hebrews because of what they did, but what they feared or were even taught to fear that they might do. The second thing is that they just did their jobs. They fulfilled the highest calling of their vocation because being a midwife was not necessarily a super spiritual endeavor. It dealt with the physical and the human, with the messiness of bringing life into the world. Their job was incredibly practical, incredibly necessary, and they dealt with the everyday ordinary realities of life. And what they did was simple and yet profound within their vocation. They used their vocation, their skills and gifts and expertise and experience that they had attained to meet the present need. By so doing, this human enterprise became a holy endeavor. They weren't just delivering babies, but they were delivering God's dreams. Their acts embodied and promoted the freedom and creativity, the kindness and the justice, the generosity and the peace, the diversity and the harmony that McLaren says characterizes the dream of God that characterizes and promotes the kingdom of God and not the reign of Pharaoh. Finally, to do their jobs, it meant that they were okay in the supporting role. 
in the Ministry of Helps. They were willing to play their parts, even if it didn't guarantee the success of the whole enterprise. Pua and Shifra were faithful to do what they could when the odds were not in their favor, when what was right seemed doomed from the start, when perhaps they wondered if they would make a difference or the difference, if it felt like they were spitting in the wind or simply delaying the inevitable. Because they knew Pharaoh. They knew the system he had set in place was designed to destroy. So can I pause here for a moment to tell you that Pharaoh was a classic dream destroyer? Because a dream destroyer rigs the system or maintains the rigged system so that their enclaves of power and privilege remain just us, those outside never get justice. A dream destroyer sees greatness and goodness in others but perceives them as a threat to their sovereignty. And so they will do what is necessary to maintain control even at the cost of lives. To Pharaoh, those Hebrew boys represented the protection and the hope and the continuation of their people. A man-child meant that there was someone or another generation to protect the people because in those days, if the borders needed defending, the men would do it. If new lands needed to be conquered, the men would do it. If foreigners tried to assault the women or harm the children, the men would handle it. And whatever one generation amassed or attained, it was up to the men to preserve and protect it for the next generation. To destroy the men then was to destroy the people by leaving the women to become the bearers of foreigners or worse, the enemy's children. But while Pharaoh had turned his attention to the boys, God kept God's eyes on the women and the girls. Beloved, we gotta be careful about who we overlook, count out or think of as insignificant. Because in the end, Pharaoh lost his life and his military because of some God-fearing women and girls. We often have the tendency to talk about Moses as the deliverer of the Israelites, but there would have been no Moses without Pua and Shifra who refused to kill those baby boys, giving women the courage to bear their sons, disobey Pharaoh, and hide them from Egyptian soldiers. There would have been no Moses without Jochebed, his mother, who risked her life keeping him alive, finally putting him in a reed basket on the Nile River, hoping someone would find him and have mercy. There would have been no Moses without Miriam who stood at a distance watching her baby brother float to the spot where Pharaoh's daughter bathed and got her mother as a wet nurse to feed her own son. There would have been no Moses without Pharaoh's daughter who had pity on the child and disobeyed her father's edict and raised him as her own. And there would have been no Moses without Zipporah who on that strange night that the Lord tried to kill Moses, circumcised her son and touched Moses' feet with the child's foreskin saving Moses' life. Pharaoh was so busy trying to kill Moses and the boys that he did not keep an eye on the women and the girls. So much so that on the banks of the Red Sea, Miriam and those tambourine beaten, cymbal clanging, foot stomping women danced at the edge of Pharaoh and his troops' watery grave. But before they could get to deliverance, the midwives had to choose what they would deliver. The two women had a choice, fear God or follow Pharaoh. And what they decided would determine if they would be dream deliverers or dream destroyers. And so I am here to tell you that even in what seems like a barren season where death and human depravity and the situation caused so much by human stupidity are all around us, there are also people who are in need of some dream deliverers or some spiritual midwives. They are pregnant with purpose, they are carrying vision, they are bearing a dream, and it's just that some of them are not yet showing. I mean, we would not know that they are pregnant. There are no outward visible telltale signs, and unless we talk with them or they shared with us, we would not know that from the outside that there is something going on deep on the inside that has yet to be seen. That deep down inside, God is knitting together plan and purpose, dream and destiny. They need someone to guide them through the process. They need someone to help them make it until faith becomes sight, vision becomes manifest, dreams become reality. And if we would follow the examples of Pua and Shifra, we too would be dream deliverers or spiritual midwives. You see, to be a dream deliverer, one has to use the power of the tongue to speak encouragement and praise and reassurance. They need someone to help them or to say something to help them do well and be well with the expectation that things will go well. That these are much undervalued commodities, but invaluable to an expected mother. 
At the time of birth, the mother can feel the pain, but she cannot see how much further she has to push to deliver the baby. And so often when dream is almost manifest, when what is inside is about to come out, what no one else can see is about to become a reality and enter the light of day where it can be touched and seen and heard and experienced, the pain of delivery gets the best of people. The position of delivery renders them blind to how much further they have to go. They do not realize that they are closer than they have ever been, that the dream is almost here. They need someone to tell them to push. They need someone to tell them and help them to hold on. They need someone to remind them what they can do. They need someone to tell them that they can make it or they can do it or they can have it or they can be it despite what Pharaoh has said or Pharaoh has tried to decree within their lives. They need someone to tell them that it's not too much longer now, because from where they are and from where the midwife is sitting, she can see what the mother cannot. The midwife can see the head when the mother can only feel the hurt. The midwife can see the shoulder when all the mother knows is that she is sore. The midwife can see the torso when all the mother feels is tired. And sometimes helping somebody give birth to what God has put inside of them just means telling them some things that they already know, that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them, that God's grace is sufficient and God's power is made perfect in the midst of weakness, that greater is the one that is in them than anyone or anything that is in this world. Being a dream deliverer means ministering to the wounds because there's no birth without pain. No matter how incredible the vision, the visionary got injured, no matter how wonderful the dream, the dreamer got wounded. And once the dream has become a reality, once we can all see it and feel it and taste it and experience, we think the job of the dream deliverer is done. I mean, after all, the dream has been delivered. But the birth left some wounds behind. Just as a woman needs to be cleaned up and often stitched up after the birth, so the dream deliverer needs to be cared for. You see, there was some hard work to birth that dream to push when they felt like stopping, to press on when others left them, to pray when they just felt like sleeping. It took a long time to carry that dream, to walk by faith and not by sight, to wait on the Lord and honor God's timing, to see others deliver, and it was still not their time. There were some sacrifices made to bear that dream. There were some sleepless nights, some turned down plates, some career changes, some job resignations, some unemployment terminations. And for some people that dream stretched them to their limits. And once a dream has been delivered, there are some open wounds and opportunities for infection and the dreamer becomes vulnerable. Dream deliverers know how to minister to others. They know how to minister to the wounds. Because at this stage of the process, the spiritual midwife must not only bless with words, but be a blessing through their own deeds and actions. You see, if the dreamer is never healed, if those wounds are not properly treated, infection will set in. There'll be bitterness towards every person that did not believe them. There'll be hatred for every heckler that said it would not happen. There'll be apathy because of every moment that they had to feel and walk this thing alone. Dream deliverers know that healing is a physical and a spiritual practice. Therefore, they know how to cover wounds with love and treat injuries with grace. They know how to handle pain with some patience and how to surround sensitive spots with some prayer. And finally, dream deliverers have to get the person ready for the next pregnancy. In the natural body, childbearing is only for a season. Every woman, if she lives long enough, will go through the change. But there is no such thing as a spiritual menopause. Dreams can be delivered no matter the age of the bearer, but the bearer must be prepared to conceive and carry and deliver again. And herein steps the midwife. Midwives know what kind of garment the woman should wear to keep things in place, know the food they should eat to regain their strength, know how long they should rest before going full speed ahead. And in the same way, a spiritual midwife must know how to bind up a person in prayer, because once the dream is delivered, the dreamer may become too puffed up with pride, become sated with their own sense of self-worth, or may become glutton with arrogance. A spiritual midwife knows that just because the dreamer has given birth, it's not an excuse to let their spiritual body go. 
because the belt of truth cannot go around the self-deceiving waist. A breastplate of righteousness cannot cover a puffed up chest. Gospel shoes can't go on self-glorifying feet. A shield of faith and a sword of the spirit cannot go on hands that are just busy patting their own self on the back. And a helmet of salvation cannot fit over a big head. The midwife knows that these are the only clothes that can keep a spiritual body in shape and the only way to keep the dreamer in those clothes is for them to eat right. And so the dream deliverer knows that they can't serve up French fried fear and glazed gossip, syrupy scandals, reconstituted rumors or hydrogenated hateration. They need to give them something that is good for them and that will feed their souls. They need to give them something from the word of God. And so midwives don't have to be preachers or teachers or evangelists. They just have to have read enough word, studied enough word, heard enough word on a regular basis that they have enough word stored up so that they have something to share. They have to have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, have their speech seasoned with grace so that their word is palatable to somebody else. Dream deliverers know that the word is the seed, and if it's planted in an environment protected by the whole armor of God, if it's watered with just some prayer, conception will come, pregnancy is pending, and a dream will be delivered. Pua and Shifra embodied steadfast faith and vision. They didn't know what these deliveries would become, what person or idea, institution or action, resistance or vision or movement would be loosed into the world by their actions. They were just faithful enough to do the next right thing, the thing that they were able to see and to do from where they were. And by resisting the urge of self-preservation, they by their actions deliver an entire nation. By saving others, they save themselves. The Bible says that because of what they did, God gave them families. In other words, they blessed others and they were blessed themselves. They cared for others and God took care of them. And at some point, we must understand that giving of our time and our talents and our resource doesn't leave us with less. It only creates more. And therefore, we must stop waiting for the magic moment to become involved. Stop looking for the next prophet or potentate, messiah or magistrate. Stop thinking that deliverance will only come through certain individuals. Deliverance may culminate in a Moses. It might reach its highest manifestation in, a G in Jesus. But the dream of God includes us all. And whereas I am confident of what God can do and what God will do, I am certain that God's ways are just and God's will is sovereign, that God's heart is filled with love for us, that in the end, God will have the final say, that as my grandmama told me, that trouble won't last always. Yeah, I am certain that the plans of God will prevail, that God is too great, God is too strong, and God is too sovereign to let this thing go completely off the rails, that when all is said and when all is done, we too will have a reason to shout for joy. But my task this morning is not to get you to a shout over the goodness of God. It's to persuade you to be on the side of God, to act in solidarity with God. And so I will end this sermon as I began it. I'm calling for the Puas and the Shifras because we need them now as much as Moses and the children of Israel needed them then.